you're now live. Good morning, everybody. My name is Tim Fairhurst from the European Tourism Association, and I'm joined by guests from our partner ECTA uh, and the insurance industry and the Hungarian Travel Agents Association as well. Um, we will just allow uh, a few seconds to roll on whilst all the participants join. But thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, please stay with us. Okay, we now have uh, getting on for 90 odd people joining us already. So I will um, begin this webinar just by uh, setting the scene a tiny little bit and then inviting the speakers just to introduce themselves and say which organization they're from. Uh, and in the case of the those gentlemen from the insurance industry and the guarantee funds explain what part of the financial protection industry they, they speak for in order that the audience can understand. Uh, then I will uh, offer a few remarks about why we're having this webinar and, and what sorts of topics we hope to cover. Uh, and then we'll get into more detail about insurance aspects and the uh, webinar will roll on from there. During the webinar, uh, you uh, as our participants are able to submit questions uh, and you'll see on your control panel to the right, uh, you have an opportunity to submit questions by text. Please could you keep the questions short uh, because I will be trying to read them as we go along uh, and I will try and select some to put to our audience. Um, I will also launch three polls during the webinar in order to assess audience opinion as to various topics from availability of insurance and its cost to the scope of the package travel directive to how we expect uh, consumers to be protecting themselves in the future. So we've got plenty to talk about in uh, 60 minutes or so. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and now we have um, a good number of people joining. So I will start by asking the participants to introduce themselves. And because uh, for technical reasons, uh, one colleague uh, uh, who from Six Swiss Re is unable to join us by audio, but uh, by video, but is able to join us by audio. So, Jan Richter, may I just invite you to introduce yourself by audio, uh, and we'll take it from there. So, Jan, over to you. Yes, so good morning, and thanks, Tim, for the introduction and for inviting me to this webinar. My name is Jan Richter. I am a senior surety underwriter from Swiss Re Corporate Solutions, located in Frankfurt, Germany. This is from where we underwrite a surety business and also the insolvency protection for two operators. So we are a so-called travel bond provider for the two operators in the tourism industry. Thank yeah, you very much. Yeah. Um, so uh, Eric Jan from the Netherlands, over to you, please. Yes, my name is Eric Jan Reuver. I am the director of the Dutch Guarantee Fund uh, which is uh, protecting consumers in the Netherlands uh, and providing bonding uh, towards tour operators. Uh, and we are in, the, in between the consumer and, and the tour operator as uh, with regards to guarantees. Uh, and uh, the Dutch Guarantee Fund uh, has uh, approximately 750 um, members. We are a private foundation and uh, we uh, protect consumers in line with the uh, uh, package travel directive. Thank you very much, Eric Jan. Um, Attila in Budapest, may I ask you to introduce yourself? Hi, good morning. My name is Attila Hoidu. I'm sitting here on behalf of MUIS, the Hungarian Association of uh, Travel Agencies. We are also a member of ECTA, obviously. Um, in MUIS, I'm the head of uh, international relations, and in my private life, I'm heading uh, STA Travel in Hungary, which is a travel agency holding also a tour operator's license. So I also do have first-hand experience with both with selling uh, travel insurance products to travelers, as well as uh, having to obtain all sorts of insurances and guarantees for my company to operate. Thank you. 
Thank you, Attila. Eric, over to you in Brussels. Good morning, everybody. I'm Eric Grezin, the Secretary General of the European Association of the Travel Agents and Tour Operators Association. We represent in Brussels for the European Union um, about 35 um, associations, uh, national associations. Our main uh, topics being, of course, um, consumers' affairs, um, but also aviation uh, and tourism in general. So we are um, a representative body operating uh, at EU level. Thank you very much, Eric. And uh, for those of you who are expecting to hear Rogério Gabriel from SGS in Portugal, he may still be joining us, but there may also be technical issues there. So apologies in advance, but he is not yet with us, but we've got plenty to discuss, so we will uh, get on. Um, I will just now spend a minute or two setting the scene for, for the discussion we're going to have. Um, some of you may have read a paper that was produced by Ekta and Etoa, uh, which sought to uh, explain why we thought that insurance and financial protection mechanisms generally were causing uh, a bottleneck to tourism's recovery. Uh, we've both as organizations been participating in discussions with stakeholders in Brussels and trying to give an account of what is happening to business on the ground and where we see the obstacles to recovery. Uh, and it's very clear from talking to members, and Eric, I think later we'll probably reference a survey that ECTA has conducted, that there is a lot of variation in terms of how things have happened in Europe over the last few months. Um, it's been ironic that it's one of the cases where more Europe has been asked for, whether it's on border control, whether it's on consistency of arrangements uh, as regards how consumers are looked after, how refunds are managed, how cancellations are managed, and so on. Uh, and one of the issues that will come up in our discussion is that despite the close harmonization intended by the package travel directive, there are still quite wide variations in national practice in terms of how those protection mechanisms actually operate in practice. Uh, and we'll be asking our experts to uh, get their ideas as to you know, how that might evolve in future. So uh, insurance is necessary. Uh, you can't operate legally without it in most places. So its availability and its cost is something that is essential to business. Uh, also its scope. And one of the questions that will come up is the degree to which any exclusions related to the pandemic and consequent loss may have arisen. How is the the market developing. So, so that's really why, why we're, we're here today. Um, and in terms of timescales, anything to do with changing legislation is long. Um, even if there were widespread agreement that we needed to review the package travel directive, uh, this is not something that's going to happen quickly. So there is an urgent need for business and consumers to understand how they can operate, how they can travel, uh, what sorts of products are available to them, and is there anything we can do as an industry together, all the various stakeholders, in order to uh, collaborate effectively, develop a new range of products so that people's confidence returns, both from a business and a consumer perspective. So that's, that's the introduction. What I would like to do is invite colleagues from uh, the insurance industry, so in this case it'll be Jan, first and then I will go to Eric Young to uh, share their reflections on what has happened um, and I know uh, for Swiss Re the focus will be on insolvency protection uh, and the mechanisms around that. Obviously the background is that insolvency protection now is happening at a time when the Thomas Cook crisis is only several months old. Uh, the industry is already under financial stress uh, so this has really been an extraordinary and unprecedented period uh, and it is very interesting to hear from uh, our colleagues in the uh, reinsurance and insolvency protection industry how things look like from their perspective. So Jan, over to you. Would you like to just uh, let us know a little bit your thoughts, reflections over the last few months and any key insights you have from the perspective of insolvency insurance? Over to you, Jan. Sure, thanks Tim. So as you rightly say, I mean, we are living really unprecedented times. Um, 
nobody would have thought that this, this scale and magnitude of the crisis would occur prior to the COVID-19 crisis. Um, following Thomas Cook, which had a big impact on the tourism industry and also on the financial sector. Um, so these worldwide travel bans being implemented by every country almost around the world. At the same time, this is something that nobody thought about and would have thought it's realistic when conducting business, when implementing regulations and laws. So as you mentioned previously, I think it is a very valid point that legislation needs to be adapted to take this outlier extraordinary event into consideration. Um, what we have seen as a surety and insolvency provider to the tourism um, market is of course that um, it is a distressed uh, situation. Nonetheless, we keep very close and good contacts to our clients. And uh, we see that them are managing the situation relatively well up to date. Of course, there are a lot of challenges and without any external supports, being provided by states, by associations, uh, with um, part-time work compensation, with tax relaxations. This would be even more challenging, but the tourism industry as a whole proved in the past with many extraordinary events like ash clouds, um, terrorist attacks, MENA crisis, financial crisis, that they are adaptive, in some respect resilient, albeit of course this is unprecedented, but we see that they are the ones that are flexible, agile, creative, together with other stakeholders like the state associations. They are coping so far relatively well and um, travels is picking up slowly. So that is a welcomed and very important step forward. So um, still to see how this evolves, but uh, it, is, it is a challenge and we'll see what, what needs to be done in the next months. Okay, Jan, that, that's very clear. And, I, and when we, you and I were discussing yesterday, I, I think one of your observations that, that there is a variety of mechanisms uh, across Europe into, into how this works. Um, Eric Jan, um, and just to incidentally uh, welcome Rogerio, uh, thank you very much for joining us from Portugal. Uh, I'll come to you after Eric Jan to, to share your insights from insurance industry from your perspective. But Eric Young, uh, the model that, that you described, um, that's not common in Europe. So perhaps you could tell us a little bit more about uh, the Guarantee Fund and also share your reflections uh, over what's happened in the, the last few months and the big takeaways for you. Over to you, Eric Young. Yeah, uh, our foundation uh, provides uh, uh, a solution towards tour operators to uh, to provide the guarantees uh, towards consumers uh, in the form of a private uh, foundation um, and uh, the members are uh, providing us with a bank guarantee uh, provide and, and those bank guarantees are uh, provided by banks or insurance companies like Swiss Re and with they with these bank guarantees we are able to um, repay um, uh, consumers in case of a, a financial failure um, actually, we, we have one, uh, a pretty uh, big one today in, in the Netherlands, um, unfortunately, uh, caused by uh, COVID-19. Um, but um, uh, our, our guarantee scheme is, is, uh, is, is, is uh, a solution uh, uh, that is not uh, quite often seen in Europe uh, by means of a foundation. Uh, the, uh, in Belgium, uh, there is a, a comparable solution, and I think also in the Nordics. Um, yeah, is there a, uh, a difference with, with, with an insurance company like, uh, like in Germany? Um, the German solution is more uh, uh, la, la, uh, insurance companies that provide uh, coverage towards uh, consumers. Um, I think th there is ultimately no difference. We, uh, when we uh, have a financial failure, we will repay the, the consumer. And uh, if the, 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 the bank guarantee we have received from the, from, from the member is not sufficient, we will use other uh, funds like uh, our own capital. Uh, at the moment, we are having uh, reserves of about uh, around 100 million, and uh, we also have uh, a facility from the state in case of exceptional uh, damages. Um, 
the current market situation is, uh, I think, uh, uh, as Jan uh, uh, described, it's tense. Um, uh, we see very creative solutions. We see uh, parties uh, trying to uh, co cooperate with the state. We have introduced in the Netherlands a voucher system like in other countries. And uh, this, uh, in this way, um, we uh, try to uh, resolve the, the, the problem of the 14 days repayment period uh, because that would cause uh, uh, immediate financial failures uh, in, 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 I think, in all the countries. And with the voucher, I think we have uh, at least um, um, provided the, the, the consumer with uh, some form of security and also for the tour operator, the, the possibility to change the travel for, uh, to, to, to the future. Um, uh, is this the, uh, the, 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 the solution for the market? I don't think so, because uh, ultimately the, uh, the consumer has the right to, uh, re to, to receive a refund. And the question will be uh, how, how many uh, refunds uh, the market has to repay and are they able to do that in the, in the near future? Um, I think this is one of the biggest issues uh, at the moment in the Netherlands. That's very clear. Uh, thank you. Uh, yes. Rogério, in, in, in Portugal, perhaps I could invite you, you, you missed the opportunity to introduce yourself at the beginning, so, so I'll, uh, uh, please, please do that and, and apologies from our side for the technical issues. Um, if you could just explain what it is that your organization does and then like uh, Jan and Eric Jan um, explain you know, what you think that the last few months has taught us and, and what general reflections you have on, on the insurance market from your perspective. So um, I'm an insurance broker. Uh, I mainly work on um, travel insurance. Uh, I've been doing that and we've been doing that for the last 20 years uh, in Portugal. And um, as far as how I, uh, what, how we are, have been dealing with, with COVID-19 and how we have been dealing with travel disruption cover since, since it, it first appeared on account of the director of 2015. Uh, what we did, we set up a, a structure of product uh, through the, the, the travel insurance. Um, and since uh, 2016, December, that's when we started, up until um, January uh, of current year, we've paid around a little bit over 2.5 million euros in, in, in losses. So these claims, they hit uh, us with the uh, Irma hurricane in 17, and then um, the Yellow Jackets in Paris uh, for like 22 or 23 weekends in a row, lots of strikes. We have a specific problem in Portugal, Madeira has one. Sometimes it's affected by wind, it has to close. So last year alone, it closed 90 days working days. So it's 25% of, of uh, business around the year. Um, and lots of strikes also, lots of bad weather. So there's certainly a, a lot of amount that we did pay and we, we got cover for our clients. And um, it's, it's a structure of product that, uh, that works. So in benefit of the client, of course, uh, and then it benefits the tour operator and the travel agency because they are protected on their responsibilities. Now, when COVID hits, it gives us another uh, perspective of uh, how we, we, we can cover this. COVID-19 situation. And we are starting to realize that it's going to be very difficult to, to, to acquire coverage for COVID-19 on travel disruption, disruption cover. I mean, we, we can do it on the travel insurance for medical expenses, repatriation, and we can even do it for a cancellation for personal reasons. The problem is when markets collapse and you close borders, there's a whole um, operations uh, system in place and, and trips that were sold going forward that uh, are now armed and 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 now um, people want to to get reimbursed on their money and it's the the responsibility of the travel um, the travel agency and the tour operator to do so 
So I perceive this as the, the, the main question today. That, that's the, the question that's going to uh, get everybody <laughs> woken in, in the night to not be able to get an adequate answer. Because from my point of view, I don't think it's insurable. And since it's not insurable, I'm not sure how tour operators and travel agencies are going to be able to move forward. Um, transferring their responsibility to the to the insurance company. So, so that's, a, that's a very that's a very sort of strong and powerful question to to leave that sort of section of your intervention. Thank you, Rogerio. The, the question of whether or not something is insurable is an existential one for the industry. If it's not, people can't operate. Um, and I think your your other point around the duties to refund following cancellation and so forth, the implications of that in a total absence of cash flow has obviously been financially extremely stressful throughout the industry. There is a lot of financial pain, uh, both in B2B relationships and arising from duties under B2C regulation as well. So it's a very complicated uh, picture. Uh, before I invite Attila to just share some reflections, uh, just a couple of questions and thank you for uh, uh, sending those in. Um, Alexander Wolfram from uh, DRV uh, reminds us that Germany is reviewing its insolvency protection scheme uh, and awaiting a legislative proposal. Uh, and the hope is that there will be, sorry, DTV, excuse me, Alexandra. Uh, uh, the new scheme will uh, perhaps be modeled somewhat on the Netherlands model. So interesting developments being discussed in Germany. So um, Jan, um, maybe you'd like to reflect on that. And another question we received earlier uh, from Alexander did so, who says that in Germany, there is currently no single insurance company underwriting mandatory tour operator bankruptcy insurance. Um, and how or when to get one for a new tour operator. So again, when we spoke yesterday for a new business, they don't have a track record. It's harder for an insurer to understand what they're looking at. So what advice would you have to Alexander? Over sure, to you, so yeah. thanks for those questions. Um, on the first point, the new legislation that is going to come into place, um, we don't know when yet, but it's sure that it is going to come because the Thomas Cook failure last year proved that the system as constipated in, in Germany was not sufficient. So um, this is going to be dealt with, uh, we hope, relatively soon. We want to have certainty in the insurance market. The two operators, I think everybody wants to have certainty. When is the new scheme going to come in place? How will it be? They made some cornerstones. Um, they set some cornerstones. So it seems to be somehow similar to the Dutch, to the Danish um, fund system, where there is a fund. Two operators being members provide a certain amount of a fee to this fund to grow a capital stock. Like Eric Jan just mentioned, they have 100 million, so that is the aim for that too. And then there would be certain layers, the first layer for the two operators providing financial security, which can be provided by insurance companies, by banks. And uh, then the capital stock needs to be increased. And uh, at the end, uh, it could be that there would be some reinsurance cover or backup facility for the, for the outlier losses that could occur. So, that is something that is really important for all stakeholders in Germany. And um, we expect the law to be passed after the summer holidays, so sometime in August, September. And by then we should have clarity on this aspect. On the second point uh, of insurance companies um, somehow being reluctant to, to provide insolvency cover for new companies, I'm not able to, to comment on that in detail due to the new companies because we Swiss Re we concentrate on medium sized bigger tour operators so they would not be new entrepreneurs entering into the tourism market. Um, but I can imagine that um, companies are now a bit more conservative and to look into the financials, the business case, the management, the track record more in detail before providing insolvency cover. The market is still there. Um, but of course, it is somehow um, more conservative and uh, um, yeah, scarce, if you want to say so. 
Indeed. Um, and, and I think market reluctance, particularly around smaller businesses, is something, Attila, you will have uh, some very clear ideas on. So perhaps I can ask Attila to share your reflections, uh, both from the perspective of running a business and on behalf of your association. What's the news from Hungary? Thank you. Okay, since the introduction of PTD, which has uh, certainly increased the risks that had to be taken on by uh, tour operators, as well as their insolvency insurance providers, we've seen that insurance companies uh, started to have less and less hunger for risk. And there were companies that uh, quietly decided not to provide uh, insurance uh, products for insolvency, or to provide them uh, only to certain um, certain company sizes. And even if you had a small company with an extremely low risk profile, you might have ended up with your old insurance partner for 15 years turning their back on you. And uh, you, you quickly had to find another partner or go out of business. And now with the COVID case, um, Hungary is a market that does not have a guarantee fund. So it's basically up to every company to and we don't have a universal um, and um, well, well-functioning voucher scheme either. Therefore, it's up to every company to agree with uh, with their customers on uh, on how to compensate them and whether these customers accept vouchers or don't accept vouchers. And then, what happens if these um, if the amount of vouchers exceeds um, any any manageable and bearable? Um, future uh, commitment for the company and we've uh, so far we've only had one Hungarian tour operator um, losing their liquidity and going out of business but their case has already brought up a few challenges with their insolvency provider because they had a few trips that they had to cancel in March and there were some trips that had had been cancelled by participants for April and then the insurance company um, who, who they had their in, uh, insolvency protection with, is saying that those contracts are not life contracts anymore, therefore they are not covered by the insolvency insurance. Whether it's a, it's a particular case for this tour operator, or this is something that uh, insurance companies will try to, um, to, to use as a, as a hedge solution to hide behind and not to pay their dues, uh, that is yet to be seen, but it's um, it's not um, not very comfortable right now. No, thank you. No, it's it's a tough picture, and I think you know you also give a good illustration of the variety of regimes in, in operation in Europe. You know, in yes. the Netherlands, there's a sort of hybrid scheme uh, where ultimately the state is acting as 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 a safety net. But um, Eric, would you like to uh, share your reflections from the point of view of ECTA, please? Um, yes, of course, Tim. Um, the, um, I think as the European organization, what we can um, see is that the story is pretty the same in Europe. Uh, that's that's the starting point. So the, what the Attila is explaining as a company, uh, issues faced by the company is, um, is faced, in fact, in many countries in different ways. Um, we, Nectar, um, that there are a number of challenges. The first one is the market challenges. Um, it's difficult, as I explained, to get professional insurance and to do the business. Um, there are very good reasons for that. Um, some are because the market is too small. You have countries where you need to have um, more uh, offer uh, and more competition from the um, insurance side. Um, and also because we are just now facing an incredible uh, time, uh, as you mentioned, with the Thomas Cook and the pandemic. Um, so we, on all the implication it has, um, as um, Rogero explained about the closure of borders and, and the quarantine. In addition, we are a specific sector. Um, we see that uh, with a, a legal um, context with the PTD and passenger rights, which uh, impose a number of um, burdens um, and obligation on the on the industry, um, which make it even more difficult to find the proper policies uh, to be offered. 
Um, so we definitely need to find um, solutions um, to, um, to, ask, to, to, to cover the risk, whether the old ones already existing and the new ones uh, with, uh, with the pandemic of COVID-19. Um, point is, in our views, that um, it's not like uh, naming and blaming. Uh, it's uh, trying to find a solution altogether to make this uh, business uh, pro a profitable and a sustainable one um, for both travel agents, of course, but also for the insurance, that there is an interest there for them to, to operate. Um, so it means that for us, in, in our views, we, um, we have uh, a need for a better repartition of risk. I mean, it's not that um, we need to intervene or to have, uh, that the system continues to, to work as it is uh, today, but there, there may be a reflection to have um, or to be made on who's doing what and how we, who is bearing the burden um, of the insurance or of calamity. Is it the consumers, is it the travel agents, maybe the state? Um, we need also to, um, to think about a way of predicting um, the risk. Um, so that for the insurance company there is um, an interest to, in, in, to intervene on this market um, and uh, as an association we first want or we have also to look at the legislative uh, dimension which is specifically um, of our let's say, the core business of an European association is certainly not the one of an insurance but it's essential to give them the night the nice or the nice, the perfect framework for um, the operations uh, to uh, to be performed. Um, saying that, we we have made a survey or we started a survey with our member association to take stock of the situation. Even though we we have a certain feeling or understanding of the difficulties they are facing, and it's exactly what you mentioned at the beginning. We have have a fragmented, a very fragmented uh, situation where uh, you have no um, no common situation uh, at European level as as regards um, insurance uh, in the travel industry. Um, it starts from the legal framework, uh, going then to um, the what well, I. You know, took some notes uh, on the availability of offers and type of policies um, that are uh, made by the insurance companies, and um, which all uh, offering all different policies in in different ways at different conditions, uh, with or without exclusions, which which makes it very difficult as a European organization to uh, um, to I would say to um, analyze and uh, synthesize for the European affairs or European institutions and, and uh, enabling a sort of uh, level playing thing at European level. So our, our demand there is really on our need in, in the coming months or weeks is really trying to, um, to improve the situation and to offer the companies uh, opportunities and see how we can do or set the perfect conditions to to give this um, this offer uh, a chance to um, to be present. Thank you, Eric. And I'm taking two big themes out of that. One is the the whole resilience of the ecosystem. That unless there is a, a, an adequate offer of insurance, that the, the, the system is too fragile. But then the framework from a regulatory perspective that underpins it uh, does need a review. And I've seen some questions already about the scope of uh, regulation in respect of airline liability and so forth for cancellations. We may well get to that. What I would first like to do is invite our audience to uh, have an opinion about the availability of insurance products now. So I'm going to launch a poll and I'll keep talking while the audience uh, uh, provide their responses. So the poll says sufficient liability insurance cover for travel and tourism businesses is getting harder to find at an affordable price. So do you agree or disagree with that as a statement? Uh, please give your uh, opinion. I'll let that roll for uh, uh, another 30 seconds or so. And for, for the panelists, uh, what, what, what I'd like to do with the discussion now is talk about the insurance offer. How do you see it developing 
uh, both from the point of view of business and consumer in a way that uh, can be sufficiently flexible, customized, adapt to the circumstances, certainly from a consumer perspective, allow people to uh, take care of risk in a way that suits them. Some people are more comfortable about risk and we've seen a lot of growth outside the package travel uh, directive in terms of people booking flights independently and accommodation independently. How will insurance market develop in order that both consumers and business have got the choices they need? So I'm going to close the poll so we can see the results. And about half of the participants uh, agreed that it's hard to find and it's expensive. Uh, and almost another 40% uh, somewhat agree with that. So uh, no one thinks that's an unreasonable statement. None of that's a surprise. Um, but uh, perhaps that's a good starting point for us to reflect on how we think the insurance market will develop. Rogerio, you have already uh, told us that you are worried that there may be cases where insurance is not possible to find. Uh, so perhaps if I could uh, start with you as the, the middleman, if you like, and then invite Eric Jan and Jan to share their reflections. Where is the insurance market going in terms of what product is available for business and consumers and for businesses to meet their regulatory obligations? So over to you, Rogerio. So as far as uh, liability uh, insurance is concerned, we, we have um, uh, one in Portugal, which is mandatory by the state. So we have, if you have a travel agency, you are, you are required to, to hold one. But um, this liability insurance does not cover uh, force majeure and does not cover bankruptcy. Uh, and so what, what happens is um, it's a pretty low risk uh, insurance, liability insurance. Um, we have absolutely no problem in acquiring that in Portugal. I mean, the product uh, has uh, the insurance market doesn't look at it uh, um, in a way that uh, it might not uh, be able to to take on the responsibilities of, of cover. Uh, we have a, a good price on that in Portugal. We, we we charge around 200 euros for one million billing uh, per year for the travel agency, which which is adequate um, and it's profitable. So. The problem is it doesn't it does not cover anything related to the to the to the package directive and um, and so uh, and we, we need to address that I, in a different way. If I could in, in, interrupt, sorry to rush because because time time's an issue. I think that some of the questions we've been hearing are the the big what if question. So if I'm an operator and I have people, the hotel goes into quarantine, there are costs arising. So there are um, both costs around cancellation uh, in mm -hmm. relation to package travel and also your duty to lend assistance and the costs arising from that. Have you come across concerns about coverage or exclusions in relation to those sorts of very foreseeable uh, mm -hmm. eventualities? So on our travel disruption cover, what what we we guarantee are some um, extraordinary and inevitable circumstances. So pandemics, terrorism, uh, bad weather, uh, strikes. So these are coverages. And uh, as far as pandemic is is concerned, we have uh, an exclusion that states that if if you if something is of public knowledge, then you are not covered for that. And of course, COVID-19 falls into that category. For instance, in Germany, if you go on a strike uh, five seconds or five minutes later, you are, you are effectively on a strike. In Portugal, it takes 30 days now. You couldn't have a coverage in which you would set up a strike for 30 days and then go get insurance to get cover for that strike that's going to happen within a month from now. So that's why we stipulate that, that uh, um, that exclusion. Uh, and so uh, um, I really can see um, a situation in which uh, COVID-19 going forward could, could, be, could be insured because it falls on, on, on the discretionary uh, policy of the states to close borders or to uh, require uh, mandatory confinement 14 days for every visit. And when, when you get into this, this situation, 
insurers get, of course, uh, nervous about taking that risk because it's it's ongoing, and uh, it, it it could bring a lot of loss. And um, sure. what is the adequate premium on on such risk? I mean. Yeah, so that, that, that in itself is extremely hard to calculate. I'd like to introduce a question before switching to uh, Eric Jan and Jan. I'd like to uh, feed in a question from Martina, uh, who says that a big issue being encountered is that suppliers such as airlines and cruise companies are not always honoring refunds for cancelled services, and operators in non EU countries do not feel the obligation to refund a travel agency who is under the PTD. So how can travel agencies not only refund consumers, but also refund expenses for which they will never get the money back? Uh, and that's a very concise illustration of the uh, uh, financial pain a lot of the uh, organizations are in. So just on the availability of insurance offer and how it will develop, just if we could spend another couple of minutes. Uh, Eric Young, if, do you have any reflections on how you see the market developing to uh, respond to the foreseeable conditions we have now. So your microphone may be muted. Um, it will be, I think, a difficult situation to obtain uh, uh, a bonding uh, with insurance companies, with banks. Um, uh, everyone raises uh, the, um, the, the 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 level of uh, protection uh, because uh, uh, if if there will be severe damages in the in the near months, um, the, 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 there is new funding needed to uh, to to protect uh, future uh, travel. So I think it will be very difficult to uh, to obtain uh, a new bonding and uh, and new um, um, uh, bank guarantees. Um, and uh, we already uh, noticed that insurance companies are uh, uh, at the moment not really um, uh, have an appetite to uh, to provide bank guarantees towards our uh, clients. So I think uh, this will be uh, an issue. Okay, um, Jan in uh, Frankfurt, would you like to add to that? Sure. So uh, what Eric Jan just said um, is is true that I think insurers are being more conservative. Um, they are not looking hunting for new business. Um, nonetheless, the, the insurance is there and it's doable. Of course, the, the terms and conditions following Thomas Cook now having COVID-19 in front of us with an uncertain outlook on, on the future. This will change um, the terms and conditions, but I think it is still insurable and um, banks insolvency providers um, will stay close to their clients. What I, I agree with um, in the comment previously is the supply chain that um, due to the directives, regulations for airlines and the PDD, um, it's very hard for them in this crisis to reimburse so quickly. So I think there should be a relaxation of the Firms when they need to reimburse in such an extraordinary event. And uh, then also another idea is that the vouchers should be somehow state backed because this will have a big relief on um, banks and insurers' limits because due to the refund credit notes, the vouchers, the limits, which would typically go down if no travels take place, they are maintained and if bookings increase again, they even go up a bit. So that's something that would be um, a relief. And um, another question on, on the products and availability is what we see and will see, I think, is um, airlines having more and more challenges. So um, having a protection also on the airline side for consumers, I think this is something that would be worthwhile thinking about going forward in the future. That's very clear. And, and certainly regulatory scope is something that, that I think we can spend some, some minutes discussing. I'm going to launch the next poll because it does get at uh, the core of what Eric Tressin was saying earlier on about what the obligations are under package travel regulations. So uh, the next question is launching now and it says current package travel regulations place an unreasonably high burden of financial risk on operators and agents. So I'd invite the audience to start to comment on that. And just as, as a bridge to the next part of the discussion, uh, Eric Tressin and uh, Attila, perhaps you could start to prepare some reflections on 
you know, in the light of what Jan has just said, um, airline liability, the the need to perhaps instead of going from 14 days duty to refund something longer, certainly in exceptional circumstances, in order to give the entire system a chance to get itself organized, the question of state-backed vouchers and so on and so forth. Um, the question about uh, variation across Europe will not go away, and despite the close harmonization intended by package travel, the variation is large, and a lot of the cross-border arrangements have caused difficulty. So um, we have um, quite a good response to that, so I'll close the poll and share the results. So uh, two-thirds of people think that it's unreasonably high uh, risk for operators uh, and agents, and I think the uh, again, not not a surprise, uh, and perhaps the um, the reflection there is if it's the case that the burden is too high on the operators and agents, there will have to be some sort of counterbalancing insurance for the consumer, so that collectively there is adequate protection. And we'll get onto the consumer question if we have time towards the end. But hey, Dressa, perhaps I could invite you to share some reflections on. How you see things going with uh, regulatory scope? I, I'd agree with your sentiment earlier. This isn't about finger pointing. This is about acknowledging that we've stress tested the framework and it's broken. Um, so we need to be honest about what's happened and be quite clear eyed and clear sighted about how to take things forward. So, so regulation, package travel, where are we going? Um, I know. You just mentioned, Tim, the, the issue of uh, harmoniz harmonization of regulation. Um, and just before you were um, referring to vouchers, uh, clearly this is the, the example that what happened has been decided at national level on a very, um, um, let's say, um, uh, diligent way. Um, no need to, uh, no, no capacity to um, to have a long-term strategy. So this is not this kind of solution that we need to propose. We really need to have a long-term reflection on what the industry can can have. On the first aspect is that um, if there are risks that cannot be uh, covered, uh, if there is um, a reshuffling into the European legislation um, and the fact of trouble for instance, then um, a very important question is um, the um, type of obligations that are uh, on the shoulder of the package organizers. Um, it has been extensively uh, um, organized or added by, it has been added by the Commission on a regular basis, um, but we reached a, a certain limit. So we need to see how we can split this burden. Um, and ensuring also, ensuring also that travelers are bearing part, a, a substantial part of this um, of, of the risk. So it's not only the liability insurance we have to, to talk about, it's also the travel insurance for consumers. Um, the other thing connected to what you say on, on, on service suppliers, uh, we need to ensure um, the cash flow um, is maintained into this industry. Um, we are talking about the airlines, we could talk also about the hotels. Um, uh, we, um, we need to, to figure out a system where the, there is a protection of um, in B2B and B2C um, uh, in case of whether insolvency of an airline or stops, um, of, uh, stop of refunds that we have seen in March and April uh, from um, certain, not certain, all the operators, um, all type of operators um, in the in the travel industry. So um, we have, I will maybe end my intervention there. We have a new consumer agenda coming uh, from the Commission side. There's a reflection starting. So it's typically um, the right moment to um, to show what are the principles we are fighting for and, um, and influence the, the Euro regulatory bodies um, to get the, the right legal frame for, for the next years. Thank you. And, and it is, as you said in previous intervention, about allocating the risk in a, in a reasonable and fair way between uh, private sector, uh, public sector, and also the consumer. Um, Attila, from the point of view of you know, Hungary, how the market has evolved there, you know, what do you think would work? What would get support at a policy level 
in terms of reviewing the, the, the regulatory frameworks and the protection frameworks for consumers. What needs to change? What, what are the big questions for you? Thank you. Um, the big change um, is expected from the European level, I suppose, rather than, than the national level. Because it, it all boils down to the PTD that set uh, very, very strict and firm obligations on, uh, on the organizers. Um, but the same obligations cannot be pushed through the whole system of, uh, of the supply chain like hotels, especially if they are established in other countries or carriers, international airlines, whether European or third uh, country uh, carriers, they do not follow the same um, obligations and they, they basically don't have, um, don't have to refund anything if they don't want to. That is our experience, certainly not in 14 days. And we've seen it with major European airlines that uh, once the COVID crisis started, they, they did not cancel flights for say three months, even if they, they suspended their flight operations, they were only canceling flights in, I mean, booked flights and tickets uh, week by week, which, which basically slowed down the process of applying for refunds on behalf of customers. And then processing these refunds has also taken weeks and weeks and weeks and we've just recently run a little research on our uh, refund cases we had uh, so far out of the hundreds of refunds that we've done in the gds system in our small company we had uh, 68 that have been approved by airlines so far and out of those seven have been repaid so the whole process is extremely slow and we've also seen major European carriers who have been warned by the, um, by the Commission that they must refund tickets if they were unable to fly. They said that, well, if the tickets were originally non-refundable, then uh, they may start processing their refunds after a 12-month uh, lead time. And, uh, and this, this really um, makes the situation uh, quite hard, if not impossible to manage on the organizers and agents yeah. level, because they still are supposed to pay back their customers within 14 days, which is Absolutely. clearly impossible. Yeah. So the whole system needs to be changed and it's not a domestic question to solve it. Absolutely. And I think one of the reflections we all have is that the, the, the package travel directive we have now uh, from 2015. Uh, the previous one was uh, from the early 1990s. So uh, this is not something that has adapted as fast as the, the travel market has changed itself. So we need to yes. find a faster way of adapting the framework. And I think there's widespread consensus on that. Um, I suppose one reflection I'd like us to, 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 to explore uh, before the end of this webinar is the consumer in this. Uh, travel is by and large, certainly for leisure, a discretionary activity. Uh, we are absolutely in the hands of the consumer in terms of whether they want to travel, whether, whether they feel safe to travel. Um, and insurance is obviously part of that in terms of anticipating the kinds of things that can happen and what sorts of protection people want. So I'm going to launch the last poll, which is um, asking our audience whether you think uh, that in future more consumers will want personal travel insurance that covers financial risk. So we're thinking about what happens if you get stuck in a country for quarantine um, and maybe that has financial loss for you because you miss a job at home or something. Um, this is not something that operators could handle reasonably. Uh, is this something that the consumers want? There are obviously lots of reflections around health and so forth, but the question is, about financial risk, are consumers ready and do they want to buy this kind of travel insurance? And maybe if we have time, uh, we can explore whether we think the market will respond to that and whether a combination of that and a, a review of the scope of package travel arrangements between them will uh, make insurance affordable uh, and bring confidence back quickly and operability. So I'm going to close the poll, find it open for about a minute and share the results. And there's strong agreement that there is 
a market out there. So uh, since uh, the insurance industry classically responds to market, perhaps I could ask our, our colleagues very quickly, we've only got five minutes, so short reflections each. Uh, Rogerio, do you have any reaction to that? Were you surprised? Uh, and do you think the insurance industry will respond um, to, to come up with more, more consumer-focused options? Yes, uh, I think on, on the provider's failure uh, on financial, uh, it's, it's, it's doable. And, um, and you, can, you can easily get, uh, get a solution to, to integrate what, what you are offering your client. Uh, the question is, I, I really don't uh, don't agree with uh, with uh, with the opinion expressed by, by the majority, so I must be wrong. But uh, I don't think uh, not consumer is, No, he's not too much worried about uh, other, the other guy's financial failure. I mean, he, he, I don't think so. Um, still, it is what it is. <laughs> but we have options. Yes, we we have solutions. So, just to clarify the point, I mean. I from a consumer perspective, it's not that they're worried about, um, you know, businesses going bust. It's simply right now, um, yes, they can buy travel cancellation insurance. That sort of thing is common. But do you think that the financial protection will become more elaborate as the foreseeable risk uh, gets bigger? Uh, as you, you said earlier, it's very hard to calculate. But you know, people might want income replacement if they get stranded in a country. Who knows? Most definitely, yes. The financial failure is going to 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 have to 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 evolve to to certain guarantees for 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 the traveler. Um, still, on on, uh, and I mainly sell travel insurance on a B two B model. Um, and and on on that scale, uh, we we have not been approached by by our clients that uh, their clients have been looking for uh, this kind of uh, solution. They they feel reasonable uh, protected by the the, the travel agency and the tour operator okay. by themselves yeah. uh, so, think, uh, sorry, to, 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 sorry to rush you again but the i think that reflection uh, very much fits in with if you like the classic uh, uh, commission-based approach to consumer protection the whole point is to have a framework where the consumer can be confident they can buy things because there will be an adequate framework but as Eric Tressin was saying it's there are gaps in this and under stress we've seen that actually the framework didn't function as intended so so there really is a, a necessity to review so could I invite other colleagues from insurance to just reflect quickly on you know and, I, and this is not your day-to-day -day business but but what the audience told us about the consumer appetite for more personal more flexible uh, financial protection do you think that's going to come do you think that will help restore confidence in travel. Uh, so Eric Young, perhaps if you'd like to reflect first, if you have any views on that. Um, I have a, a thoughts on it. Uh, views is difficult uh, in the current market, but uh, I think that uh, from a consumer perspective, I think the consumer likes to be protected, uh, especially in the Netherlands. We are a country of uh, well-insured people. Um, uh, but it's more or less the form and uh, the expenses involved. Um, I mean, if, if, if a consumer has to pay in the Netherlands 10 euros for a booking and is well protected, I think uh, on, a, on a travel sum of, uh, let's say, 1200 euros, uh, this would be accepted, I think. But um, if it is a, co a commercial product and you have to, to, to include this in, a, in, a, in an insurance uh, policy, and uh, the premium will be uh, sky high. I mean, this will not be accepted by the by the public. Uh, the the point is also, will it be voluntarily um, uh, consumers uh, um, uh, that have to choose uh, uh, voluntary for a product? I think they will not uh, accept that. Um, uh, I compare this with the uh, airline protection in Holland. Uh, you can buy uh, 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 airline insolvency uh, products. Uh, but it's only, I think, booked by maybe five percent of of people that uh, that buy a, a standalone yeah. ticket. But if it is uh, compulsory, I think uh, the acceptance will be much greater. Uh, but then you need also uh, some uh, some changes in the in the local regulations. I mean, at yeah. this moment. 
we don't charge any of our expenses towards uh, the consumer. It's all uh, um, all the expenses are um, borne by the uh, tour operators, and uh, this is of but, but course uh, ultimately, of course, that's the consumer yeah. because they're, they're paying the tour operators. So, so yeah. I think it is a, in a way of, uh, sort of designing an efficient system that is sufficiently flexible. Correct. We're, we're, we're almost out of time. Just quick reflection. So, Jan Richter, any any, any more reflections on on how you see the consumer piece developing? Yes, so I think uh, we can clearly see there is a demand, and when there is a demand, insurance companies, I think, will adapt and provide some products to take care of this. Um, the question is at what cost, and um, in the medium long term, this need for the consumers, which is there and it's obvious might not be so high going forward once there is a medicine, a vaccine there, then people will not want to insure this so much anymore. But I think it will stay uh, maybe at a lesser extent in the in the long term. But when there is a market, there will sure be some, some products available. The final question, price, costs, that's something that uh, we are not active in and, and it's hard to estimate, but I think sure. there will be something available. Well, we, we will keep a close eye. Attila, any, any reflections from the perspective of your, of your customers in Hungary? Do you think there's more appetite for personal insurance? Yes, there is certainly more appetite and more demand for, uh, for personal insurance. However, there are two things here. One is that uh, this whole COVID pandemic and its, um, its handling by the different countries has created so many abrupt situations that they cause a lot of discomfort. So beyond financial risks and beyond health risks, there is a lot of um, well calamity and discomfort that cannot really be covered by any insurance product. Secondly, the question will be once uh, uh, insurers provide the market with such a product, they will start uh, probably rating uh, operators. And it reminds me to a case when 10 years ago, a British insurance broker wanted to bring um, uh, basically a flight uh, insurance to Hungary that if you, if you bought a flight ticket, you could uh, take out a very cheap insurance policy, which would cover you in case of the airline failure. And at that time, according to their rating, basically the only, the only uh, carrier whose flights would be covered 100% would have been Lufthansa. And all the others were... I mean, kind of uh, um, either unacceptable or or uh, just partially covered, and uh, that would again create a very strange situation when a consumer wants to buy a product and then the insurance company tells them, "Okay, you can buy this trip as long as you buy it from, say, this tour operator rather than that that that." Right, that, and that's quite a long way from the the the, the level playing field single market yes. that that's been yes. envisaged. Um, yes, Eric uh, Tressa, we're, we're we're over time, but I, I first want to recognise uh, just how much help uh, you and colleagues Christine and uh, Benoit have have given to to put all this webinar together. So thank you very much to to you and colleagues for that. I think there is a lot for us all to discuss, and this has been a very good scene setting discussion to identify where we need to direct our attention in future but eric if i could give the last word to you any other final reflections before we thank our panelists and our audience i was mute um, i don't want to take much time that I, maybe to complement what the the speakers have just said on, on your last question i mean our business is a margin-driven business, so part of the solutions, we cannot add additional burden on, on, on the shoulders of the uh, travel organizers. Part of the solution uh, will be, as I said, that um, travelers have to bear part of the cost of the insurance. Um, this is not the only one, but it is certainly one of the, one of the solutions we have to, to, to go for. And the last comment, um, also because I, I look at, at maybe a broader perspective and not only an, an insurance um, business, um, Attila mentioned discomforts uh, with the current COVID crisis. I would say also a lot of confidence from the consumers into this business, be it the airlines, be it the travel organizers. You have to 
ourselves. It's it's a challenging time for us. It's a challenging time for the consumers too. So we need to get back the confidence of the consumers. And we need to get interested in traveling. And this insurance product would maybe would maybe be one of the tools that we could use to um, to show consumers that um, uh, being leisure or, or business that there is a possibility to, to travel in a safe and fast, financially safe way. That is a very good thought on which to end. And I would like to thank you and Attila, Eric, Jan, Rogerio and Jan in Frankfurt. Thank you so much for your insight. Plenty to discuss in future. Thank you to our participants. And thank you from uh, all of us at Itoa and Ekta. And thanks to Paul in the background for the technical work. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.